Um, so thank you ever so much, David. Uh, I don't know about anyone else, but I've got, uh, I've got um, blockbusters, and I'd like a P, please, Bob, in my head <laughs> from uh, the personalization uh, stuff. So there's not going to be many Ps, I'm afraid, in, in my presentation. Um, what I'd like to do, if it's OK, is just offer a couple of observations about why it's important that we're all here today. Um, I've, I've got two little kids, uh, and Oscar, who is three and a half. Um, there, there's some benefits, uh, some amazing benefits that come from having kids, and you'll know that, those that have kids or friends with it or nieces and nephews. One is that you get to wear an Ice Age plaster <laughs> rather than just usual plasters, which is quite good fun. And the other one is that they're always asking you the question, you know, why, why, Dad, what? Why, why do we do this? So it just makes you go back and sort of think about some of the first principles. Um, so I just wanted to do that today uh, briefly. Uh, then talk uh, a little bit about path to personalisation, um, and David's kindly already said where you might be able to get it, so just give you a couple of pointers about that. Uh, and then really I see my main role here is to just uh, give you a taster of some of the other people that are going to be speaking today and encourage you to uh, get involved in some of the workshops because there's some absolutely brilliant stuff uh, going on. So in terms of uh, why... People with mental health problems uh, are faced by far the biggest challenges, I think, of anyone in our society. Um, and just as a proxy measure, if we look at the uptake of personal budgets, only 9% of people with mental health conditions have a personal budget. Uh, and that compares really quite badly compared to all the other client groups. Um, and I wonder whether or not that derives from the fact that the various pilots that have existed uh, around personal budgets, for example, Ibsen, as good as it was in social care, uh, and the pilot in Scotland around SDS, only 14% of people in the Ibsen pilot had a mental health problem. Only 3% of people in Scotland had a mental health problem. So I wonder whether we're even thinking about mental health um, from the very start. And I think Rachel will, uh, has got some really interesting um, thoughts that she'll be talking about uh, after this, particularly how it relates to recovery and personalisation. Uh, spend on, on direct payments in mental health um, is, is rubbish. Uh, it's 30 million quid, uh, half a percent of all mental health spend, uh, and that compares very, very badly to spend uh, on direct payments for people with learning disabilities, where that's around £300 million pounds plus, and that's just for people under 65. So there's an absolute tenfold difference. Uh, and then there's, uh, I'm a bit of a geek, I, I apologise uh, for that when it comes to numbers, uh, but when you look at how that money is spent, what I think is really interesting is if you look at the whole mental health system, uh, over 80% of spend obviously is within the NHS. But then when you look at direct payments and how people spend it, um, the vast majority is in non-statutory providers. So as soon as you give people a direct payment, they take their money out of the system and take it to non-statutory providers. So I think there might be something there in terms of the challenges that we face and why we, why we face the challenges. Uh, a couple of graphs, just because I like putting graphs in. There's a reason to be optimistic that the trends around direct payments are positive. Although the, 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 the y-axis for, for you mathematicians amongst us will realise that you're starting pretty low there. So there's not, you know, it's a reason to be optimistic. But of course, it's not just in social care uh, that people with mental health problems are facing significant problems. Uh, so when it comes to employment, uh, people with mental health problems are way down the list in terms of uh, employment rates. Uh, and the proportion of people uh, who are on, on CPA who have employment, that proportion is actually decreasing at the moment. So employment for people on CPA is getting worse uh, at the moment. And similarly, if you look at housing and look at various measures, uh, people that have home ownership, people that are in their own homes, um, those proportions are much smaller than people without mental health problems. Uh, and uh, if you look at other indicators like homelessness, of course, and rough sleepers, mental health prevalence is absolutely huge there. So the challenges uh, and the context is, is really difficult. And, and that's the thing, you know, that Oscar, Oscar didn't say to me, my little boy, he didn't say, Rich, Dad, he didn't say Rich, he said, Dad, look at all the stats. Uh, and see what they tell you. We know all of these things, but I think every once in a while it's useful to just take a, a, a view and just think, what the heck is going on here? Oh, and by the way, uh, for people that are on CPA, which of course is meant to support people around finding employment uh, or about housing, uh, over a third of people hadn't had any help in terms of finding work, um, and nearly uh, three in ten had not had any help in finding accommodation. So that's... In the nicest sense, and, uh, and I probably shouldn't be too rude about it, but that's pretty crap, I would suggest, um, if that's okay. Probably isn't. Um, so what to do? Martin, Martin said, 
you know, we know what we need to do. Uh, it's just figuring out the reasons why it's not happening. And there was a call to action from the Department of Health, so everything should have been OK, of course, um, that there was no need for pilot schemes, that we have knowledge of how uh, direct payments, for example, uh, should work, and it's time for action. And that time for action officially started in 2006, and so we've had seven years at least of action that we've all been uh, focusing on. So, OK, that, that's the moan over. Let's, let's try and be a bit more... Uh, optimistic, which doesn't come naturally, I have to say. Um, so paths to personalisation. Uh, the aim of paths to personalisation is to try and provide information about what personalisation means for mental health services and, and supports. Um, and it's a very practical document, so it seeks to try and give examples to people. Uh, and it doesn't try and reinvent the wheel. If there's some really good resources in different places, it says go and have a look at the resources that have worked in other places. So it's a kind of first port of call that people can come to if they're grappling with the ideas of personalisation and what that might mean for them locally. And one of the things that I particularly like about PATHS is that it's not just for providers or not just for commissioners. Uh, I think often the, the challenges that users often um, make to providers and commissioners means that the problems are all on, on that side. And they're not, of course. Users have a massive role, a massive leadership role to play in ensuring that personalisation happens in their local areas. So PATHS uh, is there for everyone and not just for particular parts of the mental health system. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the, the history. Um, so the, the overview, it's, it's a whole system, whole life approach. So it looks at all of the things that need to be in place um, for personalisation to be there. So it doesn't talk just about small interventions, which of course are useful uh, and that we can do, but it looks at how all the different things can come together. Uh, and I've just listed there some of the uh, different issues and themes that are impacting on how mental health services are provided at the moment. So self-directed support, payment by results, there's a workshop on that later with uh, me and Kate, which you're all very welcome to come to. Um, and this whole, uh, you know, this whole system approach is something that Nick is going to be talking about in his workshop um, from Stockport, um, and it looks like a great workshop. So there's my little plug for Nick, for anyone that's interested. So it doesn't say that you shouldn't do the small things, but it also says that all of these things work together um, and, and to look at how those things might work. And here's a really nice um, diagram uh, to try and convey that. And this comes from the Centre for Welfare Reform, um, who I think are doing some pretty interesting stuff on personalisation and, and mental health. Uh, so that's a, a nice diagram. So PATHS has got ten themes within it. Uh, and this is a list of those different themes. And for each one, uh, it has uh, I statements. So if I come on to um, these I statements. The work was done fundamentally in co-production with people that use services, people that deliver services uh, as well, and families and carers. Uh, and so it starts from the point of view of the person. And later on, Isaac and Shahana from Making It Real are going to be here talking about um, the National Co-Production Advisory Group. And of course, Making It Real fundamentally has this approach of I statements. This is what I would want from the mental health system. And then what you have to do in order to make those things happen. Uh, and so path to personalisation in each of the areas uh, draws on these I statements. And then it has lots and lots of information that you can look at which is really useful and saves you having to trawl around for it to, to find this stuff. So, for example, in the creative commissioning section, this is what the document looks like. Uh, and we had lots of, of work to try and figure out how best to, uh, for it to work for people. So it's, it's best to check it online. I was going to print it off for you and have 100 copies, but it's like 110 pages long, but you can sort of dip in and out of it and go to the different bits, and it's all hyperlinked and all that kind of stuff. So this is what the, the document looks like, and then it goes into the signpost section, which links into all the different places. So you don't even have to search, and I don't know if anyone's noticed, but the um, government websites have changed now, so it's all gone to gov.uk, which, I don't know about you, I find that a bit of a pain in the ass, frankly, because I can't get anything that I used to be able to get. So we've even updated all of the links, so it's pretty much all available without having to go through all of their archived material. And then the final bit brings together all of the I statements so that pretty much on one page you can see um, what the system could and should look like and it has all of the I statements there and a summary basically of what people who use the mental health system would want from a mental health services and, and system. And just to re-emphasise the point, PATHS was done in co-production with people that use services, and it starts with them rather than the services or the system as it is. 
So that's pretty much it. It's available online. Uh, and we're going to keep updating it because obviously things move on. So one thing I'm really keen to do today is as you're doing your work in your areas and things that you've learnt, things that you've produced or discovered or created, um, then I'd be really, really keen for you to share those with us so that we can make sure that we can keep it updated so that practice is available. So anything that you can do there would be absolutely great. Um, and we're trying to link it in much more with making it real and figure out how can this translate you know, uh, into <coughs> practice. Um, and, of course, we can support organisations uh, to know how they're doing in terms of personalisation. And in Harrow, we've got CNWL doing a provider perspective today in one of their workshops, uh, and they're giving examples of how they're doing stuff. And I should say, if, if, I had, if I could go to a workshop, the one I would go to would be Sarah and Ed's, which is about user voice into personalisation, because I think that's fundamentally, for me, the most important aspect of uh, getting this right. So there's my little prompt for them. So that's it, and thank you so much. <laughs>